Good morning, everyone. I am Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee, and I want to welcome you all to our hearing today on the important topics of body image and the harmful products uh, known euphemistically and deceptively as detox teas and weight loss candies. I am pleased that we are joined today by fellow members of the Health Committee, Councilmember Alika Ampri Samuel, Councilmember Bob Holden, and Councilmember Andy Cohen. Today we'll be hearing from representatives of the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, advocates, and stakeholders, as I mentioned, on the topics of body image and inclusivity. We will also hear introduction number 1485, legislation I'm proud to be the lead sponsor of, which would restrict the sale of senna and saffron-based dietary products to minors. We need to encourage everyone in this city and this country to be more mindful of their health. But too often, for too long, healthfulness has been confused with thinness, with disastrous consequences for young people, in particular, young women. The conflation of thinness with health has in large part been driven by decades of corporate marketing, which has perpetuated only one ideal of beauty. And this problem has been magnified by the sale of products which prey on those misconceptions. Products that include so-called detox teas and weight loss candies. From companies with insidiously deceptive names like Flat Tummy Co. Many of these products are infused with senna, which is nothing more and nothing less than a laxative. Their core function is to block the absorption of nutrients in the body's digestive system. There is zero evidence that these products are an effective strategy for real and lasting weight loss. Use of these laxatives over time can create higher tolerance in the digestive system, meaning that users have to steadily increase their intake. And extensive laxative abuse can cause ongoing permanent damage to the liver, colon, and other areas of the body. These products don't just block the absorption of food nutrients, they also have the potential to block absorption of prescription medications, which can have catastrophic medical consequences. Given these risks, it might be shocking to learn that a celebrity would endorse such products. But in fact, to tragic effect, celebrity endorsements have played a major role in their proliferation. And I'm going to name names. Kim Kardashian. Khloe Kardashian. Courtney Kardashian, Kylie Jenner, Amber Rose, Nene Leakes, shame on you, shame on all of you for using the trust you have established with young people to push these products, to push these dangerous products because you wanted to receive lucrative contracts reportedly as much as $100,000 per post. Portraying these as an effortless route to thinness. As one marker of the viral spread of this message, the hashtag TTOX now has over 885,000 posts on Instagram alone. This industry and, theirs and, and their endorsers has pushed the dangerous idea that healthfulness and even happiness is equated to thinness. This distorted view undoubtedly increases the incidence of eating disorders, which according to the National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders, is a condition faced by at least 30 million people nationally. While this condition is most likely to affect adolescents, and especially young women, eating disorders can in fact afflict people of any age, race, or gender identity. And there is evidence that young people of color 
and TGNC and B individuals face particular hurdles in receiving treatment when they suffer from these conditions. In the face of this challenge, in the face of an industry backed by celebrities, which is pushing harmful products on our young people, New York City has an obligation to act. That is why today we are hearing Intro 1485, legislation to prohibit the sale of senna and saffron-infused dietary products to minors, to protect their health, and to fight back against our society's persistent, destructive obsession with thinness. I very much look forward to hearing from all of you today, and I thank you for being present at this important hearing. I would like to now ask our first panel, representatives of the administration, to take the affirmation before testifying, and I'll cue our committee counsel, Sara Liss. And this is for anyone who's going to answer questions also. So I know DCA is here. So if you could just raise your right hand, all of you. To affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Levine and members of the committee. I am Dr. Myla Harrison, Assistant Commissioner of the Bureau of Mental Health at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I am joined by Dr. Chanel Koble, a pediatrician affiliated with New York City Health and Hospitals at Bellevue and NYU Langone Hospitals. On behalf of Commissioner Barbeau, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the issues of body image today. The Health Department is committed to protecting and promoting the health of all New Yorkers and aims to ensure that New Yorkers have access to high quality mental health care, preventive and primary care, and nutritious food regardless of zip code. No one should face discrimination in any form, especially biases and prejudice aimed at the way their body looks, and no one should experience societal pressure to change the way their body looks. All people, regardless of their body type, should be treated with respect and dignity. While the Health Department does not collect data on rates of body image challenges and eating disorders among New Yorkers, we know from academic work that people who idealize thinness tend to be dissatisfied with their body image and tend to experience anxiety, depression, eating distur disturbances, and poor self-esteem. Women who are exposed to images of thin women experience not only decreased body image and satisfaction, but also increased anxiety. Because social media is nearly ubiquitous, we need to be attentive to the impact of social influencers on New Yorkers, including celebrities who make money based on the number of people who buy the products that they promote online. 72% of Americans use at least one social media site, and for many, social media is part of their daily routine. Among teens, over 90% report being online daily, and 70% report using social media multiple times per day. On social media, users may be exposed to images from social media influencers that idealize thinness and promote untested claims, un, excuse me, untested products that claim to bring weight loss and beauty. A study of users of one social media site found that those who endorsed a thin appearing female body type tended to also engage in social comparison and express intentions to engage in extreme weight loss. Low self-esteem and depressive symptoms have been directly linked with social media users' internalization of thinness as the ideal body form. Although academic literature on body image has primarily focused on straight, cisgender women, LGBTQ and gender non-conforming people also face pressure to conform to standards of beauty. Among young people, LGBTQ and gender non-conforming youth are twice as likely than their non-LGBTQ peers to be dissatisfied with their body image and four times more likely to report disordered eating behaviors. Individuals with body dissatisfaction are at greater risk for disordered eating behaviors, such as skipping meals, eliminating certain foods, or engaging in extreme exercise to burn off calories. Research has demonstrated that idealizing bodies and engaging in social comparison on social media are behaviors that are linked to disordered eating. Disordered eating behavior represents one risk factor for eating disorders. However, eating disorders are defined by extreme preoccupations with food and weight that interfere with functioning and can be life-threatening. 
while eating disorders are caused by a complex interaction of genetic, biological, behavioral, psychological, and social factors, addressing social media influencers' promotion of untested, unproven weight loss products may be one strategy that can ameliorate one of the factors that may be related to eating disorders. The City of New York is working to educate New Yorkers about body image issues and promote inclusivity. The Department of Education provides health education and body image and body confidence for middle school and high school students during the Health Smart Nutrition Unit. At all grade levels, lesson plans include skills development around media literacy and analyzing information for reliability and informed decision making. At New York City Health and Hospitals, physicians screen patients for eating disorders at as part of routine primary care, and outpatient treatment for eating disorders is available at certain h and &H locations throughout the city. If a patient requires more intensive care, such as an extended hospitalization or long-term outpatient care, they are referred to institutions that specialize in this care. If you or a loved one are seeking help with an eating disorder, we encourage you to call NYC Well. NYC Well is a phone, text, and online chat service that operates 24-7, 365 days a year, and is staffed with English, Spanish, Cantonese, and Mandarin speakers with additional interpretation services available in more than 200 languages. It is a confidential service staffed with crisis counselors and peers with lived mental health experience. NYC Well counselors can refer callers to over 150 providers throughout New York City who offer counseling treatment or support for eating disorders. We also encourage the council to contact the New York State Department of Health for more information on publicly funded resources and services for people impacted by eating disorders. The State Department of Health funds three comprehensive care centers for eating disorders, including the Metropolitan Comprehensive Care Center for Eating Disorders, which is a collaboration of New York Presbyterian Hospital, Cohen Children's Medical Center, and the New York State Psychiatric Institute at Columbia University Medical Center. With Columbia University Department of, Department of Psychiatry serving as an entry point, this comprehensive care center for eating disorders offers a comprehensive range of specialized clinical services at all levels of care to patients of all ages. Regarding the legislation being heard today, intro 1485, which would restrict the sale of Senna and Saffron-based products in New York City, the administration appreciates council's concern in enacting protective measures for consumers. However, to date, we have not received any complaints about these types of products and do not have the expertise to assess the nutritional effects of these products. We would like to investigate this issue and discuss further with Council the best way to address the potentially harmful effects of these products. We remain committed to ensuring that all New Yorkers receive the mental health care they need. Thank you to the Council for your focus on these important topics. I am happy to take your questions. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Harrison. I really liked the first 90% of your testimony. I, I am I'm perplexed at your response to the legislation. The stated reason is you haven't received complaints about these products. So I want you to register this hearing as a complaint about these products. And I, I want to understand your analysis as a doctor of the health impact of laxatives when not used as directed. Please. So the health department is committed um, to the promoting the, protecting and promoting the health of all New Yorkers. And we are concerned about this issue and are glad that you brought it to our attention. And um, we are concerned about um, products that uh, may contribute to negative body image as well. And we um, have resources available for people who do have eating disorder and body image issues, and that is through NYC Well, and we are very concerned about making sure people get access to the care um, that they need. As a child psychiatrist, I'm not an expert in impacts of um, those sorts of products, and I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague as she may have some additional um, input to, to offer to us as well. And I would say that as the health department, we don't have the expertise to assess the nutritional effects of these. And we really do need to learn more, and I'd be happy to continue to have that conversation with you. 
Excuse me. You're not ready to state that the overconsumption of laxatives by people who don't need them for digestive reasons poses any medical risk. Dr. Koble, would you like to weigh in on that? Thank you, Council Member, uh, for the opportunity to discuss uh, this issue and for the question. Um, uh, Currently, there isn't a tremendous amount of medical literature about the um, ex uh, specific ingredients in many of these uh, weight loss um, or other supplements that you've referred to. Um, we do know that they do contain um, a number of ingredients that do have laxative properties that um, in clinical experience uh, with overuse can lead to uh, things such as diarrhea, uh, law, excessive loss of fluids, uh, electrolyte derangements, and other health concerns um, if used improperly. Uh, the challenge with many of these materials is that we don't know all of their constituents and the exact amounts um, at this current time. But those fears are exactly why we need to protect young people. If you don't know the ingredients, if you're unsure about the dangers, and if people are using these for purposes for which they weren't created, there's high risk. We, this, this blocks the absorption of nutrients. It also potentially blocks the ab absorption of medications. Is that not accurate? Someone on prescription medication might see the effect blunted by the consumption of these products? So uh, thank you again for that question. Although I'm not in the position to um, discuss specifically about blocking medications that would vary depending on the actual agent, from what we know about medications like Cina, in particular that are used, um, prescribed by physicians for constipation, um, with excessive use, you can have complications that I've mentioned before, um, but there certainly needs to be more in the way of research uh, to really understand the true impacts um, of the specific agents that you're referring to and medication absorption. Um, Commissioner, you spoke in your remarks about the problems of eating disorders. Do you accept that the marketing of products in a way that defines beauty in one and only one way the marketing of products that conflates healthfulness to not just thinness but happiness, that that could accelerate and amplify the incidence of eating disorders among young people? We know that um, eating disorders are a group of disorders that include anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorders, and as I um, stated in my testimony, are characterized by extreme preoccupations with food and weight and have an interference then with someone's ability to function. Some of the symptoms of those eating disorders are using laxatives, diuretics, or appetite suppressants as a symptom of this disorder in order to control their weight um, or their um, intake of food and eating disorders you know are mental illnesses that really do cause significant distress and impairment in social occupational and other important areas of functioning and we are very concerned about um, that and making sure that people who have eating disorders are getting the care that they need given the the likely harm of these products given their contribution to um, incidents of eating disorders why doesn't the city ban their advertising? We ban the advertising of tobacco products near schools. Why don't we do that for these products? Uh, as the health department, I'm not sure I can, as my position at the health department, I'm not sure I can comment on that specific um, issue. I know that we need to learn more before we can commit to this suggested change. And, and even if you're not willing to go so far as to, to push a ban, which I would certainly support, the city can much easily, without any legal hurdles, produce its own advertising on subways and buses, alerting people to the realities of these products, that they are uh, they're, they're nothing more than laxatives, that they don't contribute to any sustained weight loss, and that they uh, shouldn't be confused with a step towards healthfulness. Why don't we put those messages out there uh, using the resources at the city's disposal. 
I would be happy to take that issue back and have conversations with my colleagues, and we could get back to you on that. You said that the uh, city can offer guidance to people who are suffering from eating disorders by calling NYC well. What kind of referrals do you make in that service? What kind of advice do you offer? So when I mentioned um, NYC well, um, I was mainly referring to it as an information and referral line um, to access the well over 150 resources that are on their, um, their resource directory for people with eating disorders. Does the Department of Health partner in any way with our Department of Education, with the public schools, to get messaging out about eating disorders and resources available to those suffering? Uh, the Health Department works closely with our colleagues in the Department of Education, and we were involved in the creation of the health curriculum that the Department of Edu Education rolls out to its middle and high school students where there are um, there are topics related to nutrition and, and eating and physical activity and mental health, and we were involved with them in that. But are we teaching in the schools about the societal messaging which drives so much of these eating disorders? Are we teaching in the schools about what science says related to so-called detox teas and so-called weight loss candies? Are, are kids getting any curriculum that can help them use science to evaluate these products? So when we worked with the Department of Education on their health curriculum, there are, we worked with them also on topics related to social media and, and literacy around those sorts of areas. And if you have further questions related to the Department of Education specifically, I, I'd suggest that you bring them in for that. Uh, okay, but the school of, the Office of School Health has a, mm -hmm. uh, a report directly to the Department of Health, correct? So this is under your agency's purview, is it not? Is so, health education curriculum not under Department of Health purview? So the health curriculum, we worked with the Department of Education on their health curriculum, yes. What is the best course of treatment for an individual suffering from eating disorders? So I'm not prepared to talk about treatment specifically related to eating disorders. I can see if my colleague from Health and Hospitals would like to address that. So um, in my experience um, as working as an adolescent pediatrician for over a decade, um, eating disorders are very complex and multifactorial, and so is the treatment. There isn't a one-size-fits-all as it relates to treatment. Treatment often involves um, the coordination of care between a medical provider, psychology, psychiatry, as well as nutritional counseling um, that's really tailored toward the age of the individual and their presenting uh, uh, complaints. Um, in my clinical practice, um, it really uh, does differ um, patient to patient, um, but really recognition and awareness and linkage to care early on can really impact positively those that may be at risk or afflicted with eating disorders. Okay, um, I, I, I want to wrap up soon with all of you all, but I, I, I want to zero in on your objection to this bill, and I'm going to read back what you, what you stated, Commissioner, which is, to date we have not received any complaints about these types of products and do not have the expertise to assess their nutritional effects. That, that, that is your rationale for opposing our effort to prevent access to these harmful products amongst young people in New York City. Thank you for that. I don't think we're saying we're opposing these efforts. What we are saying is that we need to um, learn more information and we would be happy to have further conversations with you. And, and what information can we provide you? Or what information do you need? I think we'd have to get back together and, and then have that conversation with you. Okay. Uh, this is not a new issue. These are not new products. Some of them have been available for decades. Yes, they've been accelerated in recent years, not recent weeks, recent years, by social media and by celebrities pushing them. But sadly, this is not breaking news. 
This is a growing problem to be sure, but we are essentially in a battle between propaganda and facts here. And there is an industry which has tremendous resources backed by celebrities, which is pushing propaganda. I invite you to spend some time perusing the website of Flat Tummy Co. It is, it, it could be a masterclass in propaganda. It is frightening the way that they have conflated these products and the ideal of thinness with health. It, it's actually outrageous that they're able even to produce content like that. So our only hope is to counter that so that we ensure that young people get the facts about what is in these products, really what is in these products, about what their impact is, about their, their usefulness or frankly lack of utility for healthy weight loss, and to directly counter the underlying philosophy behind these, this entire industry of conflating healthfulness with thinness. And so in that battle, we need public health leaders who have titles like doctor in front of their names or commissioner in front of their names to speak up. And I, I don't think that we can say in 2020 that we're not going to act because we haven't gotten sufficient complaints. I don't think we can use that as an excuse for failure to act. Not when the stakes are this high, not when an estimated 30 million people in the country suffer from eating disorders, a disorder, by the way, that has very high rates of mortality and other negative impacts. So we have to act. We're doing that with the tools at our disposal in the city council, and we're not going to stop pushing this bill. And you, you have told us today that you're going to come back with um, answers on many questions that you weren't able to address, and we, we, we want to get those answers, and we're going to continue uh, to push this bill in our battle against these harmful products. All right. Thank you. And we're going to move on to our next panel, which, oh, forgive me before you leave. Uh, part. I want to acknowledge uh, our colleague in the City Council Health Committee, Councilmember Bob Holden, uh, for some questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, 870,000 posts on Instagram with the hashtag TTOX. Um, that's alarming. Should, should our we should educate our parents, first of all, to, to, to notice that these, the kids are taking this, that this T-tox uh, or T-detox um, in their diet, because I didn't know about it. Uh, and, you know, I've been around a while, but I didn't know that this was harmful. I'm hearing it for the first time. It makes sense, though, that we should be alarmed. Uh, when, I was a, when I was young, um, we had celebrities hawking cigarettes, tobacco, uh, saying how great, you know, the mild flavor was and so forth. And we even had little cigarettes, you know, little um, bubble gum shaped as cigarettes and powdered sugar to, to, uh, to be the smoke uh, on the cigarette. And, and they, would, they would sell that to kids, which is ridiculous. So this we could look at. We have to be ahead of the curve, not behind it. If this is going on, we should alert parents. Our schools should alert parents. This, um, this health, um, health smart nutrition unit in the schools, is that, is that a regular class or is that just once in a while? Um, I have to get back to you on the specifics of that, that particular question. Yeah, because this, this is, you know, if we're not aware of this, then we're losing an entire generation to this and we could, you know, it could cost many lives. So it's not, nothing to be, uh, we should, the health department should be ahead of the curve. We should alert parents to this if this is harmful, if, if the kids are doing this, and apparently they are on, on a large scale. So that should not be just, oh, we're, we, we don't know too much about this yet. Well, we should find out. So I, I agree with the chair. I think this is something that, as a parent, I would want to see what my child is, is, is drinking tea. I would, I would first say, oh, tea, all right, it's a tea, but if they're 
binging on this stuff and taking it um, regularly, we should know about it as parents. And, and it's up to the, our schools to educate not only the, the children, but the parents too. So I think at this point, the health department should put out some kind of notice, advisory, that this is going on. And, and shame on, like the chair said, shame on celebrities who, this is not doing anybody any benefit and, and it could cost lives. So that's why we need to be ahead of it. So I want to thank you, Chair. Thanks for that. Thank you, Council Member. I did just want to ask you about one contradiction that's been on my mind, which is the health department's stance towards CBD, which you are seeking to ban as a additive in New York City to things like coffee. Um, CBD, the science is not out on that yet. In fact, there is already documented research that establishes it as helpful for conditions uh, of people who suffer from seizures. And, uh, and there are certainly anecdotal reports of other health benefits that need to be verified for sure. But your department has been aggressive in seeking to ban CBD. How do you square that stance with your refusal to consider a, a ban only for minors of, of detox teas and weight loss candies? As the health department, we are concerned about the health of all New Yorkers. The specific your question, question that you're asking me um, is uh, most related to our position that the FDA um, has said it's not approved of food additive, and um, that's what that CBD. But the FDA hasn't approved Senna as a uh, dietary additive for weight loss. Right? This is this is off off label usage. So I think we'd have to get back to you. You're asking a, a good question, and I hear your concern, and I think we can get back to you on that. Okay. Uh, I'd feel safer in a city that allowed consumption of CBD by adults and prohibited the purchase of weight loss teas and candies by minors. I would feel less safe in a city that banned the sale of CBD to adults while allowing the sale of detox teas and weight loss candies to minors. That is potentially the policy, that is not potentially, that is currently the policy stance of the health department and uh, I don't see how that contradiction is defensible. I want to thank you all for testifying and I want to call up our first panel of public testimony, which includes uh, two social media influ influencers, but these are the virtuous kind. We're going to be joined by Renee Cafaro and M, who happens to have the credential as an ambassador for the National Eating Disorder Association or NIDA, and I want to thank you both for joining us today on our first public panel. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge that we've been joined by fellow member of the Health Committee, Council Member Inez Barron. And um, if you'd like to kick us off, Renee. Thank you so much, Council Member, um, for, for letting us speak. Um, this is a very important issue. Detox teas are some of the most dangerous diet scams as they are marketed as healthy in promoting overall wellness. Excuse me, Renee, is your microphone on? I just want to make sure you're recorded for, uh, is the little light on? Oh, there, there it we is. Go. Great. Thank you. If, you. if you wouldn't mind starting, we want to get <laughs> sure. you recorded. Um, no, I want to thank you for allowing us to speak today on this uh, very important issue uh, concerning detox teas and weight loss scams <clears throat> that are being marketed falsely as a track to wellness. Um, additives like set are laxatives. You know, we've heard a lot from, from you about this. And I understand, um, unfortunately, I'm disheartened, but I understand the position of those who spoke before us because it just proves that why we need to be here for this, this hearing. That there is still a systemic issue where people do not know how to uncouple the weight loss industry from wellness and health. And we are turning a blind eye on what it is doing to our children and what it's doing to society as a whole. Um, in order to keep this somewhat brief, if you'll just indulge me, I think I'll skip directly into um, 
being the anecdotal evidence perhaps some of the people in this room need. Um, some of you know me as my uh, prior life in city and state government, but I've spent the past five years dedicating uh, my passion for social justice towards body image, uh, eating disorders, um, the recovery, and plus size women. I am the US editor of a body positive magazine called Slink, and I have spoken on national media uh, and many universities on the issue of body image, uh, body dysmorphia, and the misuse of diet products. Why this is so important to me is because I am possibly the proof that they need. I didn't go and walk into the he Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, when I was a teenager and complain about uh, the all-natural, uh, supposedly safe, over-the-counter uh, diet products that I was using and abusing in hopes to become thin. Um, because I didn't really know there was anything wrong with them, which is why we need to be here. We now know, I mean, this was back in the 90s, uh, we now know better. Uh, if the same body can wrap their arms around something as amorphous and, and new as the dangers of vapes to our children, we should be able to do this. When I was a teenager, um, I've always struggled with my weight. And my mother actually was the first person to give me an over-the-counter herbal uh, detox tea um, with laxatives and herbal pills that were supposed to be appetite suppressants uh, in elementary school. Um, the idea was that it was safe. I mean, granted, this was the early 90s. We know a lot more than we did then, but apparently not by much. And I spent most of my adolescence um, chasing the idea of thinness because thinness is supposed to be health, thinness is supposed to be beauty. And doctors, family members, schools, none of them stopped me. In fact, many of them encouraged me because no matter what I was doing, I was still technically seen as obese on the BMI scale. I had turned to uh, anorexia, uh, thanks to the National Eating Disorder Association, actually only about a year and a half ago, did I fully understand that I was actually can be considered anorexic even though I was fat. Um, I was restricting my calories to under 500 calories a day, sometimes under 100, uh, working out and taking uh, an insane amount of over-the-counter um, products. And even when I complained to those who were supposed to be protecting me about headaches, about malnutrition, about the fact that I had reached a plateau, um, I, I was met even by doctors with what I felt was a uh, bare minimum, I think, to legally cover them, to say, oh, I should work on this with a nutritionist, or, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't be taking so much stuff, or maybe I, you know, I definitely shouldn't be restricting my, my eating so much, but on the flip side, when the same sentence, but you're really still obese on the BMI scale, you've got to lose as much weight as, as fast as possible. So what is a teenager supposed to do with that information? What I did was I turned to all the get skinny quick schemes out there. Some are very predatory and will continue to charge your credit cards. Um, you know, what I preach now uh, in my capacity as an influencer on, on body image is that we must understand that we are all pawns in the, what I like to call the weight loss industrial complex. It is built for us media and weight loss scams and social, me and social media influencers who are you know, getting paid for this all need you to feel terrible about yourself so you can come back and, and buy another product, buy another month of this. Because if it really worked, you'd only get the $19 out of you the first time around. That's not profitable. That's bad for business. These are made for these to be scams to keep you coming back. And that's exactly what I did. That's exactly what so many people I knew did the same time. And that's how so many women that I'm meeting now when I went back to my alma mater of Stanford University, I met with their uh, student group now on body image, which did not exist when I was there. And it was just so heartbreaking to see that they're struggling with just as much as I did um, 15 years ago. This is not just about Senna. The Senna, to, Senna is a great start to something to ban. But this is part and parcel of a larger issue where we are allowing our children to put things in our bodies without knowing what it is. I mean, to me, it is about being mindful of what we're putting in our bodies, and that is real wellness, that is real health. The way that the city of New York has tackled trans fats, and sodiums, and put warnings of calories on, on menu boards, that's the exact same reasoning why we need to have more education 
and I call upon DCA and your colleagues in the council to look forward into what we can do about marketing, limiting the marketing to children around schools, and putting out our own message about warning what these things really are doing. Because as you heard earlier, yes, it is blocking the absorption of nutrients, and you don't need to abuse them. These are very strong and potent laxative teas. Uh, when you take them, I mean, all diuretics are made to do their job. And um, it's not about taking an, an unholy copious amount of them, um, but really just taking them or taking multiples of these types of products at the same time. Because again, if you're seeing that they're all natural, they're over the counter, they're cheap, there's nothing to make you believe there's something wrong with taking as many as you can get your hands on. And if your goal is to look like what it looks like in the magazines or to make your mom or your doctor happy that you've lost that 10 pounds in a week or whatever your, your goals are, you'll do whatever it takes. Um, children do have, and I say children, you know, even 17 year olds aren't quite children, but minors are obviously equipped to be able to tell the difference between a scam and, and right and wrong, but when they are being pressured every day in such a way that even adults like myself who do this for a living sometimes still battle with my own eating disorders, it is very difficult to say no. And so we have to do our part to inform, I absolutely agree with Councilmember Holden, absolutely need to inform um, the adults of the issues with Santa products and these all supposed all natural safe diet products because so many people made the same mistakes my family did thinking that these were safe to give to children with weight issues. And it is not a safe alternative. It is masking something that is really just abuse of, um, of harmful additives, whether they are naturally derived or not. And it is perpetuating this idea that thinness is health and my mental and physical health were damaged. Um, like many, and I speak on behalf of millions of women who feel the same way as an ambassador for the National Eating Disorder Association as well, um, that this is something that of major concern um, of, of mental health. Once we start getting ourselves into that system, everything is interconnected. This is today about sanities, but we're talking about something that is one piece of a much larger machine that is causing depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and uh, body dysmorphia for generations to come and it needs to end now. We've done this for decades. We know what, what the after effects are. Let's get to the root of the cause. We are New York City. We can be the ones who lead the charge and make the difference. I urge all of City Council to support this bill and support this ban and also to think towards the future of what more we can do to help our, our children and to help end this epidemic of, of body dysmorphia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renee. Thank you. Thank you. Em? Thank you, council members, for allowing us to speak today. Um, my name is Emmy Aronson, and uh, I am a 30-year ambassador for the National Eating Disorders Association, a uh, social reformer of sorts, um, a rebel rouser around body image and self-esteem for quite some time. Um, I've had the opportunity to travel throughout the country over 30 years talking, communicating, listening to teens, uh, young adults, uh, adults and their parents. Um, it's very concerning that uh, we continue to see, as Renee had just stated, uh, different packaging of the same insidious pro uh, drinks and teas uh, masked as healthy and natural without limitation of regulation. Uh, there seems to be a pullback from time to time, as I've seen over the three decades, but it continues to move forward in billions of dollars being made on the backs of young people to get them in first, and then younger uh, adults, and then parents. There's a top-down educational issue that is that has not been addressed, uh, and if New York State, New York City, um, can lead the charge in in educating not only our young people and also the the the, the people who are in uh, New York City, but the parents, top-down, everyone, full court press needs to understand what a laxative does to an individual's body. Period. And if 
end of point. Um, these laxatives that are in the teas that you are so called in the in the uh, in the bill uh, are used for surgery to help empty out a lower intestine. Period. When we see this in teas and being marketed to teenagers to be able to have that unattainable um, image of uh, beauty, uh, very much not inclusive, very exclusive. That perpetuates a problem of thinness at all costs. We are seeing an increase as a National Eating Disorders Awareness uh, Ambassador as well with Renee. Uh, we see that eating disorder clinics not, not are just half full, they're brimming over with people. It's very hard to get in, it's very costly, sometimes $40,000 a month to be able to get help. Um, and a lot of people, now more so than ever, men that are stepping up, boys, brothers, men, um, those that are specified as men or not, uh, we're finding that it's, a, once again, a full court press as to who is being affected by eating disorders that are triggered by these types of um, promotions, advertising. Uh, and it really, if we can make a change and get this bill passed and have all the doctors that are involved in the health system in New York City go visit an inpatient program of an eating disorder clinic and listen to why they're there, that would be very helpful to understand how grave the situation is throughout not only in New York City but all across the United States and around the world. But we, if there's not enough understanding of how this is affecting uh, your, your constituents in New York City, go visit a program. Do get dedicated to that. Education is vital. I understand, do I have one more minute left? Okay. Um, I understand that uh, education is vital, but I'm afraid that if there isn't um, not only a ban on uh, this diet tea, it seems like it's just a slap on the hand when you're facing a very large industry. So if there's another step, if there's committed or continual uh, uh, infractions of this particular bill, we might need to come up with something that will really sting in order for this particular tea to end, as well as other products, promoting their uh, not accurate uh, weight loss claims and what the young people will be able to attain by taking this. Um, it is very, very important when we don't have our youth dreaming and being happy wholly with who they are. Because that, once again, is our most natural resource, but down to the tubes. They're more concerned about their body shape. They're more concerned about how they look compared to everybody else when they can actually be grooving in their own shoes and making their body the best that it can be. That is the most important resource that we have in our country, and we're losing them to suicide rates, eating disorder clinics. We are wiping away a whole generation of young people. Why? Because of the mighty dollar of these very big, very strong, very powerful um, diet-related industries. And if, Thank you, you. if I may just add Please. one quick point that I forgot to mention that I think is very important to address those who are ignorant to the issue and think that there's not enough statistical information to prove they don't have enough complaints. That shows the ignorance and what eating disorders are and what abuse of these products are. You suffer in silence. That is the point of abuse of these types of products. Not only do we think that they're okay for us, so we don't think there's anything to report, but when you've suffered body dysmorphia and eating disorders, you aren't a statistic because nobody knows until it's too late. And that is what is important. We need to make action before we have the statistics. If anyone would like to know more information, please go to nationaleatingdisordersassociation.org. Thank you both for that powerful testimony and for your voices, your brave voices in this debate, in this battle. The health department stated that the first rationale they listed for opposing the bill was that they're not receiving complaints about these products. How likely is it, in your opinion, we'll start with you, Renee, that a, a young person would file a complaint with the New York City Health Department about one of these products? Um, quick uh, point of order. Uh, we were not sworn in. I did not Actually, we, we only do that for members of the administration. Okay. There, I'm like, there's I, a presumption I of trust. We were be, okay, I just want to make sure it counts. Um, 
I'm sorry, so the, the question is, what are the odds that someone will be complaining to? Yeah, that a young person is going to find a way to complain to the New York City Department of Health. Um, I would say slim to none from the young person, because, again, you are facing biodysmorphia, and your goal, you're, you're so in the bubble of trying to uh, get that flat tummy from flat tummy tea that um, you don't think there is an issue. You will not complain about it because the only thing you might complain about is if it's not working for you and you're not getting skinny fast enough. Um, the odds are um, because they are already ill with disordered eating and um, you know disordered use of these products, um, they aren't going to self-identify and bring themselves in to complain. Now, parents might. Um, you know, educators might, but we need to educate all of them first for the warning signs. We actually do need to have someone on the council, on the board, excuse me, on the board of health, then that is a, a doctor that sees patients on a regular basis, then that has an eating disorder practice. Then we will have a better understanding of where we're at in the state of in this New York City. Absolutely. So we are up against an industry with a very large ad budget that is using that money. Fitting New York City. Yeah. Yes, that is using that money to pay for social media uh, validation from celebrities, from influencers. Could you explain the impact to someone who maybe hasn't kept track with the power of social media? When someone of the stature of a Kim Kardashian or Kylie Jenner or Khloe Kardashian, or Amber Rose, uses their platform to reach their millions of followers who trust them to send the message that detox teas and weight loss candies are healthful, that they can even make a young person happier, ignoring all the potential medical complications. What impact does that have on a young person? What impact is that having on this discourse in our society? Um, do we want to take that? I'll jump in real quick and, yeah. and yeah. It's a driver. It is a major, major driver for making billions of dollars for these companies. There are very, very few companies that are making so much money uh, and it is, the, it is the vehicle for these companies to, to make the money at any cost, no matter how it affects the individuals. One of the issues that I see here is that there needs to be parental education of these uh, images, these promotions over social media, uh, and having more conversations with the children around the d dining room table, um, more communication in general as to what's going on in their daily life. What are they consuming? What if they're, you know, mom and dad are paying the bills, they must ha know where the money should be going, or at least they should. Once the parents can understand that their children or young people, teenagers, are consuming these products, then they have a conversation about why individuals that are social media uh, icons and, and celebrities are not the best uh, people to align their identity with, their value system with. But when we have um, a lot of young people not having dinners at home on a regular basis, there's not the lack of connective tissue of conversation, unfortunately. Uh, as the, the, this decade continues going forward, we just started this get decade, but the last decade, with social media being introduced into it, uh, there needs to be a lot more communication from teachers, parents, doctors, well-informed doctors that understand that these things are out there and they're harmful. That being said, I actually, you know, that's a good start, and yes, we need to do that, but to, to your point specifically, what is the impact that these celebrities and influencers are having on our children, you need to look no further than the ad budgets of these companies. I mean, they're smart. These companies are not going to be wasting a dollar on the Times Square billboard versus uh, a Kardashian. They are choosing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these influencers because they know that there is a return on that investment. They see it 
uh, many, many industries are using them. They are the billboards of today. And they, people flock. And we, there are younger children. Yes, all minors, but they're starting 10, 11, 12 years old, following and like sheep, buying whatever they're seeing on Instagram, being part, uh, uh, pushed out there by their favorite celebrities because they, it's being pushed out as a safe, fast way to get to that aspirational goal of being like that celebrity and looking like that person in the magazines they want to look like. So it is absolutely effective on brainwashing our children into a life of body dysmorphia and abuse of products like this. These celebrities, Kim Kardashian, her sisters, Chloe, Kylie. All influencers that have tea talks or any of these tea should be, I echo your sentiments, council member, shame on them. Shame on each and every influencer, whether you have 10,000 followers or a million. Shame it it, it is them. shameful that they're abusing the trust they have with young people, and they're doing it for one reason. Money. They're getting paid. Lots they, of money. Whether they acknowledge it or not, they are getting paid. Do we have any idea what these celebrities receive for their social media endorsements? Uh, it changes, honestly, um, in regards to how many followers you have and what your engagement is. Uh, and on what platform. I mean, a lot of this uh, really spread like wildfire on Instagram, but now we're dealing with TikTok and YouTubers and all, all sorts of things out there. Um, so depending on where you are in that stratosphere, no different than an ad buy uh, on the streets where uh, a bus shelter will cost you less than a Times Square billboard, it's along those same lines. So um, I've heard reports of upwards of, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars for a post. For Dancers carry themselves and realize that that feeling one of being so small, so fragile, was one that I craved too. So I bought a box, took it home with me, and drank a cup before bed. Now I expected to lose weight almost instantaneously, but what I actually experienced was a horrible, gut-wrenching cramps, followed by a disgusting round of explosive diarrhea the next morning. Had I read the label more carefully and Googled the ingredients, my body's reaction would have been apparent. The key to the detox yeast flavor was an herb called senoglycoside, which also happens to be the main ingredient in many stool softeners. I had essentially, unknowingly, chugged a mug full of liquid laxatives. But the truth was, once I was done, I felt a wave of ecstasy wash over me, one that I had never experienced before. It was the feeling of being full of my own emptiness, complete and utter emptiness. I could feel my hip bones protruding. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't expand my stomach. Thanks to these teas, I had finally accomplished what I had set out to do in my pubescence, take up as little space as possible. Now, senoglycoside is not, to my knowledge, an addictive substance. And no, drinking one cup of tea won't change your life forever. But when you consciously or subconsciously struggle with disordered eating or body dysmorphia, and get even a small taste of that faint, exhausting, delicious emptiness, any amount of weight you perceive yourself as gaining or bloating you imagine will be exacerbated. A cookie crumb can feel like it weighs 50 pounds. Your mind can trick you into believing that you're sucking up all the air in the room. So you turn back to the thing that made you feel good about yourself, and more importantly, gave you some semblance of control. For me, that was the tea. I needed to pursue that feeling for five more minutes, even if, and I did not realize this then, it would affect my body for a lifetime. And so, I took the tea every single night before I went to bed, and like clockwork, my body would eject whatever I had eaten the day before as soon as I awoke. I followed this pattern for almost two years, and coupled with a restrictive diet and near incessant exercise, I lost a lot of weight. But instead of asking me if I was okay, my friends and family told me I looked great. What's your secret? They wanted to know. Their encouragement and validation, but also the suggestive manner in which they hinted at something illicit, was all I needed to hear in order to keep my voice and my vice under wraps. But that all came to head two years later when I went away to college. Although I had calculated how much tea I would need in advance of leaving home, I hadn't been prepared for how my change in lifestyle would impact my body. 
I was eating differently and sleeping differently. My routine disrupted. I began struggling to digest meals. It felt as if every bite of food would tickle my throat, just waiting to come back up. So I ate smaller and smaller portions throughout the day, an apple here, a kind bar there. But my body was no longer gaining the nutrients it needed, and I was getting sicker and sicker. One second, I'd be chatting with a friend in the library and feel as if I needed to cough. The next, I had unwillingly projectile vomited all over my sweater. It felt as if my insides had turned against me. And when I went home to spend Thanksgiving with my family, and my attempt at participating in our annual meal resulted in me crying on the bathroom floor, my mother forced me to go see a specialist and get to the bottom of what was wrong. Let me be as clear as humanly possible. Consistently consuming detox teas in my adolescence absolutely destroyed my digestive system. Over the course of two years, I was diagnosed with two chronic digestive illnesses, first with celiac disease, followed by gastroparesis. Because of the laxative effect of the teas, the nerve endings that line my stomach are permanently damaged, and I digest food so slowly that I have to be constantly mindful of what, when, and how I put everything into my body. I take daily medication to help with the acidity of having an empty stomach for hours at a time. If I go even a day without taking my medication, I experience writhing pain in my abdomen, heartburn, reflux. It basically feels like my digestive tract has been set on fire. Some days I get so bloated and uncomfortable that I struggle to get out of bed. But the worst part, definitely, is the involuntarily spinning up of my meals, which can happen at any time with very little warning. Quite frankly, it's disgusting, and it's a demeaning illness that's difficult to manage, and I will have to do so for the rest of my life. But I am in recovery, and mentally, I am healthier than ever before. I now see my body as a source of strength because I put it through so much, and it still stands tall. But not all have been this lucky. Since speaking out about my experience, I have been contacted by so many people who confess to be struggling with what I have personally referred to as laxative-based bulimia. These people are young and old, male and female. They range from every race, size, and class. But they all have one thing in common. They've been struggling in silence and in shame, unaware that anyone else had identified this as a real problem or a real illness, a real form of disordered eating. These products are sold in grocery stores, pharmacies, and bodegas, hidden in plain sight amongst everyday household items. They are in our mother's kitchen cabinets and in our little sister's backpacks. I was just a child when I made a decision that I had no idea would impact me for the rest of my life. And I had no clue what I was doing to my body. And I have to live with the consequences of my ignorance until the day I die. No one else's child should have to bear that burden, and no adult should shoulder this secret shame alone. A bullet on its own is just a bullet, but when locked and loaded, we all know it can escalate into something much more deadly. If we're going to examine the impact of these products, it would be irresponsible not to look closely at the context in which they are used. It's time to step back and take in the big picture before it's too late. Thank you. My goodness, Iman, thank you for speaking out. I know that can't be easy, but I think your bravery is inspiring and will inspire other young people to confront this. I think you're doing a lot of good by sharing your struggle. And we're grateful that you're here to get that story on the record. Thank you. Please. Um, good morning, my name is Carrie Donahue, and I'm here today on behalf of the National Eating Disorders Association to express our strong support for New York City Bill Number 1485. Um, thank you to Chairperson Levine for, um, and all the members of the Committee on Health for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and thank you to all the advocates for speaking out and sharing your stories on this really important issue. Um, I currently serve as the Public Policy Manager at the National Eating Disorders Association, which is also known as NIDA. NIDA is the largest national organization supporting families and individuals affected by eating disorders and is based right here in New York City. NIDA serves as a catalyst for prevention, cures, and access to quality care. 
I am proud to be with you here today to speak about the importance of this legislation and its impact on the eating disorders community. Um, first, I would like to thank you, Councilmember Levine, for your sponsorship of this important initiative. Um, we really appreciate your leadership um, in working to protect minors and other individuals across the city by limiting access to these Senna and Saffron-based products. These products are often included in things like dietary supplements and sold with claims of weight loss. They are often sold without evidence supporting their efficacy or safety and pose a particularly concerning risk to those struggling with or at risk for developing an eating disorder. Eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa, binge eating disorder, bulimia nervosa, and others are extremely serious, potentially life-threatening conditions. 30 million Americans will suffer from an eating disorder at some time in their life. In New York City, the number of people currently struggling with an eating disorder is estimated to be approximately 848,000. Eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of any mental illness, right behind the current opioid crisis. As you mentioned earlier, eating disorders do not discriminate. They affect people of all genders, races, ages, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Research does show that weight loss products such as detox teas and other dietary supplements sold for weight loss can be a catalyst for these life-threatening illnesses. 35% of normal dieters progress to pathological dieting. Of those, 25% will progress to partial or full syndrome eating disorders. These products, including those with Senna and Saffron, often give false claims about a miracle weight loss, which can be very harmful to those struggling with eating disorders, causing some individuals to aim for unreachable and frankly dangerous expectations. Recent research that has just been published this month from the Harvard School of Public Health found that adolescent and young adult women who used over-the-counter diet pills or laxatives for weight control were six times more likely than peers who did not use these products to be diagnosed with an eating disorder within one to three years of beginning use of these products. In addition, any product that encourages people to intentionally lose weight is directly perpetuating weight stigma, discrimination, or stereotyping based on a person's body size. For people with eating disorders, discrimination, or the fear of discrimination if their weight increases, um, is a necessary result of improved health and recovery can be a matter of life and death. Nita would also like to emphasize the potential of these and similar substances to contribute to poor body image in youth, which has been correlated to a number of problematic outcomes, including suicidality. Nita views this initiative as an important step toward the prevention of eating disorders in the city of New York. For these and other reasons, Nita asks the committee to support this important initiative to protect residents of New York City from Senna and Saffron-based products and to take steps to keep these products out of the hands of our youth. Thank you for your time and consideration, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Kara. I just have to clarify a number that you shared with us. The number of people currently struggling with an eating disorder in New York City you cited as 848,000. That's an estimated number, but yes. Uh, that is an astounding figure. We understand it's an estimate, but any number anywhere close to that, it's alarming. Mm -hmm. And it's a reminder that this, does, this is not just a national challenge, it is a New York City challenge, which is why we must confront it here in the City Council. Thank you very much. Um, Sarah? Hi, everybody. Councilman Levine, I'd like to thank you so much for bringing up this very important issue that impacts so many. Just as Renee was saying before, a lot of people who suffer with eating disorders do so in silence. And a lot of times, people's parents encourage them in these unhealthy behaviors because that's what pop culture says what the right thing to do is. These parents think that they're helping children. Uh, my name is Sarah Hamill-Smith. I am a plus-size model, digital influencer, TEDx presenter, and storyteller. 
and my professional background previously was advertising and public relations. So I understand the power of marketing and the way that marketing can impact people's behavior. Um, I was body shamed for most of my life. And as a child, my mother gave me, when I was around 12, I started to gain some weight and my mother gave me these detox teas to take, um, thinking that she was helping me. Um, this progressed into, as I got older, eating disorders. I was anorexic, I was bulimic. I used to pass out in school and faint. Um, and all everyone surrounding me ever told me was that they were proud of me and proud that I was losing weight and proud of how beautiful I was looking. Um, I spent most of my life feeling ashamed of myself, ashamed of my body, regardless of what I accomplished in my professional life or my personal life, nothing mattered. All that mattered was that my body was fat and I wanted to be thin. Um, until in my mid to late 20s when I discovered, funny enough, a group of women on Instagram that were plus size models. And I had this transformative experience where I realized, oh my God, like nothing's wrong with me. It's the marketing. It's the marketing. It's pop culture telling people that something's wrong with them when nothing is and it, forcing perfectly healthy people to adapt these extremely unhealthy behaviors under the guise of health. So I dedicated my life to empowering and inspiring others and educating others about these different issues, um, which is what brings me here today. Um, I just, sorry, let me check my notes. <laughs> You're doing um, great. <laughs> um, oh, I just wanted to share something. Recently, I went to the doctor for an annual checkup and everything came back perfectly healthy. The doctor actually shook my hand and said, congratulations, Sarah, you've achieved great health, but you need to lose weight. And I wanted to share that today just to bring up how systematically ingrained this unproven correlation between thinness and health is in society. Like the doctor's lit a doctor is literally telling me, congratulations, you've achieved great health. And in the same breath telling me that I need to lose weight when every, every single thing that was checked, all the things that, that say that my body's perfectly healthy are coming back clean, she's telling me that I still need to lose weight. And it's so damaging. I know people who have been refused gynecological examinations because of their weight. I know people that have been refused care from doctors. I have a friend that had a tumor in her brain that they, they, wouldn't, they didn't diagnose and took too long to diagnose because everything was just like, oh, you're fine, you just need to lose weight. And so this pop cultural issue of uh, the way that society views that fat is so bad, and it, it's extremely damaging. And to get back to the issue that we're discussing here today, it is an extremely important conversation. As, as we can see, it has many ripple effects. I think that it's so important that we're here talking about this. This is a great, great place to be, to be starting, to, to really take a look at what are we promoting as healthy, what are we, what are we providing to children as, as being healthy, what are we saying, what are we educating parents, what are we telling parents that this is something good. Like I said, my, my mother gave me this tea. Renee's mom gave her this tea. Um, you know, it's really frightening, and, and again, I, I want to congratulate all of you for bringing up this very important um, conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for being with us and for sharing your story. Uh, it's so important. Um, Iman and Carrie referenced the fact that this condition can affect young people of any background, of any race, of any gender identity. I wonder if you could speak to the particular challenges that people who don't, who uh, who might not be uh, young white women, would face in seeking treatment uh, for these disorders. Try. Well, you have to understand that the conversation around disordered eating is not as I guess, evolved or pervasive as the conversation around mental health and mental wellness. Women 
I'd say that the majority of women that I know have struggled with some form of disordered eating or body dysmorphia, but if they don't have the resources, if they aren't given um, the education or the environment at home to openly discuss how they feel about their bodies and themselves, they're not going to be able to diagnose themselves or understand what they're going through or get the help that they need. So additionally, a woman of color from a lower income background is uh, statistically less likely to be taken seriously by medical, hair, me medical care professionals. Um, they um, are less likely to be heard um, by schools and by educational professionals. Ultimately, like this is a pro this is a problem that isn't being broadcasted, and this conversation is so um, is is so overarching that people think of it as a part of the daily landscape, not really something that is being discussed in courtrooms. It's it's commonplace. People don't even uh, people don't even blink when discussing things like diet supplements or detox teas. And it would be foolish to think that only the few women that are in positions of privilege and power that speak up are the ones who are suffering. That is not the case, and they only are using their platform to, I suppose, raise the voices of those around them from more marginalized backgrounds and communities. Thank you. Um, Iman and Sarah, both, you both discussed the role that social media played in, in, in your mistaken impression that these products were healthy. I wonder if you could speak more broadly about what this means for young people that uh, celebrities with millions of Instagram followers are accepting money to push these products. What impact does that have on young people? Well, I actually, in my testimony, mentioned that in my personal experience, this was brought to my attention from a friend, not social media. This, my problem, outdated the invention of Instagram as well as the popularization of other social media platforms. Um, I have been able to bear witness to their normalization through the use of streaming services and online platforms. Um, but I just wanted to clarify that I think the fact that I was able to walk to a convenience store on my block and buy 50 boxes of tea to bring home for a semester of college um, is uh, suggests that this problem is overarching, larger than social media, and if the internet were to black out tomorrow, God willing, we would all still be struggling with tackling this issue because it really, it's, it's, it looms so much larger than our smartphones. With that being said, uh, I think that uh, the effect of social media on the mental health of adolescents is one that um, I touches every single, every single conversation that you will engage in when you're talking about the health of youths. Like, but I think part of the issue is um, older adults thinking that thinking that um, it's as simple as a Kardashian Instagramming about the, the teas. I mean, it's, it's not that simple. You have to think, remember that um, health and wellness and fitness Instagrammers with much smaller followings have been posting about products like these for decades and um, as long as Instagram has been around. And those people have much smaller, more dedicated followings. If anything, I'd say that um, Gen Z is more quote unquote woke and they, they can see through the, the propaganda of people like the Kardashians because of they've been called out for so many missteps, cultural appropriation, um, the perpetration of diet culture, et cetera. It's more so the, the nano influencers in my opinion and in my experience and the friends and the family that can 
have this pervasive effect. And also, when we're talking about social media, I think the the greater danger that we have to be aware of is that it just further perpetrates this um, ideal of the uh, female beauty standard. And I have a 13-year-old cousin who is constantly trying to look like the um, the standardized Instagram model of beauty, and I see her uh, sort of contorting her figure and her appearance to fit in with that image. And I think that this is something that, again, has outdated Instagram because I grew up without Instagram. It was invented when I was in high school, and I still felt like I needed to conform to a different standard of beauty that revolved around thinness. So social media and Instagram is only a product of the problem, not the problem itself. But um, yeah, I, I realize I'm rambling, but I would just say that I believe that if you have a platform, you have a responsibility to educate yourself about what you are selling. Thank you. Uh, I believe Councilmember Holden has a question. Yes, thank you all for your testimony. Again, it's an education. Um, and uh, I want to say that just the fact that they're marketing a tea, because we're all taught that teas are good. We're all taught that teas are, you know, are healthy. So by putting a drug like this, a laxative, in a tea, I think that's irresponsible. But the marketing uh, or the warning labels, I don't know, Iman, were the warning labels, did they tell you that you shouldn't drink this every day? Or I can't speak to what I looked at and read on the box. Um, when I was 16 at the time, and I don't remember the first time I saw it, but it was as unassuming as possible. Um, it was marketed as a cleanse, a health product. Um, I did not feel appropriately warned about what would happen to my body if I took them consistently. And I also want to note that I live on Houston and Mott, and I recently went to a deli around the corner from my apartment, and I looked for the exact same brand of tea that destroyed my digestive system years ago. It was still being sold between the green tea and the Earl Grey. Right. Yeah, so that, that's exactly my point. But I just want to say I, I admire your testimony. Your, your testimony is well written. It's, it's wonderful. I think it should be required reading in our schools uh, because this is, no, this is a very important point. Most, this, this is an amazing story and I'm sorry it happened to you, but I, I really want to thank you for coming today and, and warning other people about this situation. And, and parents should also read this, but I think it should. We should give it to the Department of Health to pass it around um, if, if, with your permission, but it should be, um, may, everybody should be aware of this. And thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks and I just here. wanted to quickly add that I think the most important, I'm so pro this ban because I think ultimately, while it's important that parents are educated about the warning signs and what to look for and the brands of tea and when in the day and how routinely their children are drinking said teas, um, I gaslit my parents for years about what was in these teas and I was lying to myself as well as them. So. I think I'm very um, for a complete ban on the sale of these products to minors. I think it's the most effective way to stop them from purchasing the teas. And yes, uh, I wasn't expecting the um, administration's testimony to make me so emotional, but as I was listening to them discuss what I see as their negligence, it made me realize how so many are suffering while we sit in here in this in this small room and discuss the fate of so many um, bright and opportunistic individuals. So thank you. Thank you. And at the end of the day, we are here to consider a legislative proposal, which would do exactly what you said. Make it so that a 16-year-old in the city can't just stroll into a store in their neighborhood and pick up dozens of these boxes as you yourself uh, related having done. This is about uh, protecting kids from easy access to products which are not good for them, which feed the kind of terrible body image stereotypes which contribute to low self-esteem, 
which contribute to eating disorders, and which are part of a broader corporate effort to push only one type of body image as the ideal of beauty for young people. And we are taking a stand against that and in favor of a concrete proposal to protect the young people of New York City. And despite the very disappointing response of the administration today, we are not going to back down in this fight. We're going to push as the city's legislative body to pass this bill on behalf of young people in New York City. Thank you to all of you for adding your voices to this debate. It was incredibly important and powerful to have you on the record. Uh, I admire your bravery. Thank you very, very much. And this will conclude our hearing.